On June the 7th, did you believe that your financial house of cards was about to crumble? On June the 7th? Yes, sir. Absolutely not. Um, had, had you had, and I think there's documented evidence, state introduced, had, had you had reached out to Russell Lafitte at Palmetto State Bank about extending a line of credit on the Moselle property? Yeah, I had reached out to him. I, I can't remember the date of that text, but it was fairly recently. I, I had reached out to Russell. And on June 7th, did, did you have equity in the Moselle property? that or you and or you and Maggie had equity in that Moselle property. Sure. And I mean Moselle was fully in Maggie's name. Okay. Um so but yes, there was equity in Moselle. In looking at the documents that had been used, there was a million eight hundred thousand dollars owed. There was an appraisal for three point Three million without timber value, and so on. Seventeen hundred acres. You know, I don't know what the timber value was, but if you just set a thousand dollars an acre, that'd be another million something dollars in value over and above the appraisal. I, I doubt the timber value was that high. I'm just using that as an example. But if it was five hundred, it'd be another eight hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, there was several million dollars in equity in that Moselle property. All right, and did, uh, did you have equity in the Edisto Beach House? Yes. And on, around June 7, how much equity did you have in the Edisto Beach House? If I remember the records correctly, there was about $250,000 um, owed on that house and whatever the value was at the time, I, I think, I, I think there's a contract for just under a million dollars, so seven hundred and something thousand dollars. Did um, Maggie's death make it more difficult to obtain financing immediately after the murder around June seventh, eight? Maggie's yes. How so? Because the entire Moselle property was 100% in Maggie's name. The Edisto property was 50% in Maggie's name. So I was only a half owner. So with Maggie, all I had to do was get her to sign the documents, which she always did. I mean, she didn't question finances. So, I mean, she signed the papers. When Maggie wasn't here, there was the state issues. I, I, could, I couldn't go and sign the papers like I would normally go and get a loan. So, I, I, I couldn't. Okay. On, um, was there a hearing scheduled in the voting lawsuit where you were a defendant set for that week? Yes. Do you remember what day it was scheduled for? Well, I mean, I've heard the testimony, and I knew, I'm sure I knew at the time it's June the 10th, Thursday, June the 10th. Right. Um, were, what was your uh, level of concern about that hearing coming up on June the 10th? About that hearing? Yes, sir. Um, my level of concern about that hearing was about the venue motion that was coming up, which um, – Now, what do you mean by venue? The venue motion is – venue is where a civil lawsuit is pending, and so – there's laws and, and, and rules that govern where you can bring a case. There's laws and rules that govern how certain parties, a defendant or a plaintiff, can go about trying to move it from one place to another. So in this case, the plaintiffs, the Beach family, 
had filed suit in Hampton County. Parker's was trying to move venue to Beaufort County. And I wanted the case to stay in Hampton County. Um, and, and really, that was my only thought about, I wasn't doing the legal work on those. I, I was a party in that case. I, I wasn't. I mean, Danny Henderson was primarily representing me personally, John Tiller. Uh, and Amy Bauer were representing me personally, and Dawes Cook was representing me personally, and those are the guys that were doing the legal work. So, you know, um, I, I wasn't actually doing that work, but what I was concerned about was the venue motion. I had already done what I had to do for the financial motion, and, and Danny Henderson was on me about getting him a financial statement because... Well, let, let's stop. So there was a motion to compel and seek a lot of financial records from you. Was that correct? Absolutely. And were you concerned that your house, financial house, was going to be opened up for the world as a result of that hearing? No. I've been a plaintiff's lawyer, like Mr. Tinsley that sat here. We do the same exact thing. In my law firm, the, the guys in my law firm are some of the best lawyers that I've ever known. And they're definitely some of the best lawyers in the state, handling some of the biggest cases that have ever gone on in this state. In my 27 years of practicing, plaintiffs always are trying to look and get financial documents of corporate defendants, of, you know, those type things. In my 27 years, I've never been able to get a judge to order anything more than a net worth statement prior to getting into a phase at trial. So early on in the case, I am not aware of, I personally have never, despite trying repeatedly, have never been able to get a judge to order the kind of information that Mark Tinsley was saying he was seeking. Were, were you working on a document for that upcoming hearing? Yes. And what was that? A financial statement. Okay. A and financial statement lists your assets and your liabilities. And had you reached out to uh, Jeannie Seconder later that the day on the 7th to get your current balance of your retirement account? You know, I don't remember doing that, but that certainly be something that I, I did and because I, I, I know I'd have to have that for that financial statement. And the document that I prepared was what Mark Ball talked about that he found later in my office. And it was, tight, it was handwritten, ready to be typed up by, you know, because of the charges against Paul, I was so, I kept everything very close in the civil case. It was Danny in his office um, that was doing it. And I had that document prepared, handwritten in the neatest handwriting that I could make because a secretary other than mine, a paralegal other than mine, was going to be the person who was going to put those, that financial information into the final document. And that's the document that Mark Ball talked about that he found on my desk whenever it was that he found it. Okay. So that was what was going to be, if necessary, what was going to be used Thursday. Alec, the jury's heard uh, about uh, testimony of you stealing client funds. Did you do that? I did. Did you yeah. steal um, or divert that Ferris fee away from the law firm? I did. Um, how did you get in such a financial predicament that led you to steal money that wasn't yours? You know, I'm not quite sure how I let myself get where I got, but it came from, you know, I battled that addiction for so many years. I was spending so much money on 
pills. I got in a spot I couldn't. Now, what type yeah. of addiction are you referring to? My, my addiction is yep. to is to opiate painkillers, and, and when specifically did you, oxycodone, oxycontin. And when did you first become dependent or addicted to opioids? Oxycodone or opiates in general? Opiates in general. I'm not quite sure of the exact date, but I can give you a time frame. I, I hurt my knee really bad playing football in college, and I had a knee surgery. And the, the, the medical science at the time was such that the, the, the surgery didn't work, bottom line. So I, it, 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 it just didn't last. So within a couple of years of that, I started having a lot of knee troubles, and ultimately, I had to have a, a, a couple of surgeries, but um, this, this, the, the last surgery I had was, I think, around 2002 or four, And I, I think it was around four. so I would have started taking hydrocodone a couple of years before that. And I took hydrocodone, got addicted to that very quickly. Um, I continued taking that for a long time. I would, I'd, I'd, I'd force myself off of it, wean myself off of it. I'd go back to it. Um, I, I, I just I battled that for a long time, and after a while, I was taking so much of that, I moved on to oxycodone. And um, you know, I'm guessing that was around 2000. That that, that transition was around 2008. Nine, something like that. Um, and of course, you know, it, it, it just it just escalates, and escalates, and escalates. And it's, it's did, did you um, receive treatment or go to detox on occasion? I did. How many times? Um, that I went to detox or that I detoxed? Well, let's start with going to a detox facility. Um, I've been to a detox facility three times. When was the first time? Um, December of 2017. Okay. And um, before December 2017, had, had you tried to detox at home? <laughs> I tried to detox everywhere I could. When you, Maggie would help me. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, when, when you um, when you went in to a was it inpatient facility? The detoxes, the the formal detoxes that yeah, I went in, to in December 2017. Yes, yes it was in, in it was inpatient, and all three formal detoxes that I've done have been at the same facility called Sunrise Detox in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's it's very good it's, facility. Jury's heard of audio tape of a telephone conference with sled agents. Was that where you were during that meeting with Mr. Harpooley and I? That's correct. Um, the, the first time you went to the detox in Atlanta, uh, how, how long of a stay is that? Did you stay? Seven days is, is the um, opiate detox program. And, and is there a difference between detox and rehab? Yes. What's the difference? Uh, detox is the uh, it's the act of getting the drugs out of your system, getting to the point where okay, there is no longer a physical dependency, all right, and that's a big difference than the rest of the dependency. But the physical dependency is supposed to be gone after seven days. So, in other words, the, um, I mean, there's so many things. Opiate withdrawal is, I mean, it's, it's hard. Um, but supposedly at the end of seven days, you don't have those physical symptoms like, I don't want to be too graphic, but you're, you know, you're sick, you throw up. You um, you have terrible diarrhea. 
you sweat like you're running a marathon. Um, you can't hold your legs still. You, 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 you can't lay down now like what I'm talking about, the, the legs moving. That goes away after about 24 hours. So, you know, after about 24 hours, you can lay down again and, and, and maybe sleep some. But you sweat. Um, you throw up. You have all, I mean, you just have, there's, there's so many issues. But after seven days, those are supposed to be over. That's what detox is, the detoxification of your body. And what's rehab? Rehab is the period that, that you go to learn how to stay off. You know, you supposedly off after detox. Rehab is where you get help staying off. And uh, before September 2021, had you ever gone to that second stage of rehab? No. So in June, excuse me, December 2017, how long did it take you to relapse uh, once you got home from detox? Not long at all. I mean, you're still going through. And though this physical dependency is gone, you still have, I mean, you're still so sick. I mean, you just. Is that something you've been battling for quite some time? As long as I can remember. How long have you been drug free, opioid free? 535 days. And I'm very proud of that. I want to ask you uh, questions about Labor Day weekend 2021. Okay. Do you, do you remember being confronted by your law firm? Sure, I do. And what were you confronted about? Stealing money. And did you admit your misconduct to your law partners? Well, to one of my law partners and one of my and my brother and my law partners, so Danny and Randy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, did admit it, admit it now. And they, they learned about a fake forge account. Did you, you admit to the fake forge account? Yes, I did. And uh, did you tell them about your opioid struggles, opioid addiction? I told them about my addiction, yes, sir. Um, to your knowledge, were any of your law partners aware of your addiction? Not just to my knowledge, I'm certain that they were not aware of my addiction. How would you char characterize your, your opioid use or addiction? Severe, moderate? Uh, then or now? No, in, tw in 2020, 2021? I mean, I, I don't know how I would have characterized it then. After going to rehab and learning um, more of the things I've learned, um, really talking to addicts about experiences. I mean, I, I will tell you that my addiction was extremely, extremely bad. How were you able to function? Or were you able to function? Yes, I was able to function. You, you were able to practice law? Yes. And were you successful practicing law while you were addicted to opioids? I, on some level, yes, sir, I was successful. I mean, I... After you were confronted on uh, Labor Day weekend 2021, did, did you resign or were you forced to resign from the law firm? Absolutely. And then on um, Saturday, September the 4th, Do you remember what happened that day? Saturday, September fourth. Yes, sir. I remember. And what what happened? Start when I woke up. Well, let's start after you met with Chris Wilson. Did you meet with Chris Wilson? I met with Chris Wilson at my mom's and dad's house in uh, Almeda. And and did you lay it out for Chris Wilson? Your opioid addiction and your misconduct? I, I, I definitely laid out my uh, addiction. I, I definitely gave him some details about um, monies that I had taken. I didn't give him, we didn't go into okay. all the details about all of it, but 
I, I certainly was very candid with him about the things that involved him. Had had you already just contacted the the detox facility um, before you met with Chris Wilson on the fourth? I, I believe that we had already. Um, at, at that point, I believe that we had already already uh, spoken to the guy that I knew from Sunrise and made arrangements for me to go there on Monday. Okay. And um, I know we had arrangements for me to go there on Monday, and I, 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 I'm sure we had to have had it by then because I went to the hospital shortly after that. So, yes. And, and did you reach out to Blanca to get your insurance information? I did. And, and for what purpose? Um, because I was going to use my insurance at uh, detox and rehab to help pay for it. 